It was late Sunday morning. Genity was having breakfast in a luxurious country mansion. A respected man, a well-known surgeon in the city, practicing in one of the most prestigious private clinics. He lounged imposingly in an armchair in a silk robe and sipped his custard coffee, reading the morning press, watching with one eye as his young wife Sophia bustled about him, running back and forth and setting the table. Oh, she's a hell of a girl. It's like a poured apple, like an apple on a stick, and her character is easygoing. She tolerates everything. She's afraid to say a crossword. That's right. That's the way. And that's the way it should be. A woman shouldn't be bossing around the house. Sophia put red caviar sandwiches on the table, a steaming omelet, and his favorite apple pancakes. His wife went over to him and called him to breakfast. Genity, go eat. Everything is ready. Otherwise, it will get cold. The man slapped her, laughed loudly, and replied, Not Genity, but Genity, and the coffee, judging by the smell, is not so good. You could have tried better. Sophia blushed and looked down, said nothing. Looking out the window at the Genity said, looking out the window at the overgrown lawn, We need to hire a janitor sensible. We should hire a smart janitor to tidy up the territory. Fedor, the gardener is good, but he has become too old. But he's too old and clumsy. I will look into the matter today. Sophia was silent again, and her opinion did not. Interested in anyone's opinion, she only nodded her head in agreement, put away the dishes and began to get ready to go shopping. Genity placed an advertisement for a job. And in a couple of hours, he started getting calls from applicants. Passed. A week went by and Genity still hadn't found anyone. Either obvious alcoholics or teenagers came. Who definitely would not work on their conscience. The next weekend, the security guard brought in another candidate. Genity looked at him meticulously, wrinkled, unshaven, a cap pulled over his face. His hat pulled down over his face. He looked like a criminal. The master of the house asked angrily, Where did you come from? You're obviously a jailbird or an alcoholic. What kind of janitor are you? You can't do it, can you? The man answered quietly, I wasn't in jail. Here's my passport. I, I don't drink. I've just been through life. I will work hard. At least I need some money. I'm not. I don't ask for much, only 700 rubles a day. For the greedy Genady, this was a weighty argument. The previous candidates asked for at least a thousand. All right, I'll take you. Fyodor has the equipment. You'll take the gardener. You'll live in the gatehouse at the edge of the estate and everything. Should be shiny and shiny. Not a speck of dirt, not an overgrown weed. Is that clear? He nodded his head. And that was that. It was six in the evening when Sofia came running into the house with a pile of bags and purses, out of breath. She knew that she was very late, and now she and her chauffeur, Ivan, would have no luck. Just, the woman had not bought anything new for herself for a hundred years, and her feet had carried her to the boutique. The process of trying on things for a woman is a great pleasure, time flies away. V. As a result, she got an excellent raincoat and neat shoes on a small heel. At home, the first thing she did was to put on her new clothes and turn around in front of the mirror again, smiling at her reflection. Suddenly, she heard her husband's threatening voice behind her. That didn't bode well. The mood instantly faded. Where have you been walking around for so long? What time did I? I told you to be home. Why did you pack so much stuff? Sophia spun around in front of her husband. Honey, does it really suit me? It's just that autumn, and all my clothes have long gone out of fashion. Genity shrieked and barked. And where are you going to walk in these clothes? In front of whom to show off? I'm working my butt off. I'm doing three surgeries a day. And all she does is waste my money. Sophia got really offended and she said, but you yourself forbade me to work. I'm tired of begging you for money every time, even for the bare necessities. 
You are not like that. Well, I'm a woman, and I just want to look good. You don't want money for me. Then let me go to work. I'll buy everything with my own money. He got even more excited. I'll give you a job. No way, you'll be embarrassed. They'll laugh. The wife of a famous surgeon has to work. Stay at home and please your husband. Do you understand? Hurry up and go to the bedroom. You'll be working off your rags. An hour later, Sophia was sobbing on the bed, feeling like a used thing, a plaything. This was not the marriage she had dreamed of. Why did it have to be like this? The woman cried and remembered her childhood and youth. Sophia grew up without parents, raised by her grandmother, Abdokia, a well-known healer in the village, and a midwife. Women went to give birth only to her. They were not afraid, and they did not want to go to the district center. The girl's mother died when she was only seven years old of neglected pneumonia in the city. Nothing was known, so the grandmother took her granddaughter to her place in the village, took care of her, and loved her immensely. They used to go together in the morning, while the dew was still dewy, for medicinal, fragrant herbs. Her grandmother told her granddaughter about every petal and taught her to know what worked. Then they lay them out in the attic, dried them, gathered them in bundles, and hung them up. They smelled. It smelled crazy. Sophia often helped with the births. She was on hand. My grandmother would tell me, Sophia, bring some spring water, heat half of it in a basin, and put some succession in it. Let it infuse. Give me a sheet. And now hold her hands, hold her hands, so she doesn't hurt herself. Every time a screaming little lump came into the world, everybody cried. Grandma, Sophia, the mother in labor, and the baby. So the girl fell in love with medicine with all her heart, and she couldn't imagine any other profession for herself. Sophia did well in school, she tried her best, and Boris, her best friend in all subjects, was the best in all the subjects. The boy was in love with her from the very first grade, carried her briefcase faithfully, stole apples and strawberries from the neighboring garden, gave her armfuls of wild flowers. They were literally a watercolor couple. Everyone at school yelled after them. Tilly Tilly Doe, the bride and groom. Sophia and Boris liked to build a hut out of twigs and hay somewhere at the edge of the village, under the river, and sit there for a long time, counting the clouds, dreaming of travels, how they would finish school and go, and go to school together and be sure to be in the same group and never be apart again. At 14, Boris saw Sofia off from the disco, and near the gate he kissed her for the first time, not childishly on the cheek, but as an adult, passionately and tenderly. Sofia's heart almost. Her heart jumped out of her chest. She, of course, pushed the boy away and shouted indignantly, Boris, are you completely stupid? And quickly ran into the house. And then, she looked out of the window as he stood waving at her, his face so happy happy. But children's dreams were not destined to come true. One day Boris ran to his girlfriend's house very excited, and upset, and burst out from the door. Sophia, it's all gone. We're leaving tomorrow, with my parents to the city, for good. My father was offered a good job as a driver there, so they're going and I'm against it. I beg them to stay, not to go, but they won't go. They say, you're too young to decide. What shall we do now? I can't do without you. I'll run away. Do you hear me? Baya, I'll leave quietly at night. I'll climb out the window. Will you come with me? The girl cried and threw herself into Boris's arms. He couldn't stand it either and sniffed his nose. Grandma got worried and decided to intervene. So, you, Boris, do not be foolish, he will run away. And don't get upset beforehand. I've lived a long time. I've seen a lot. Believe me, if it's your destiny to be together, there's no getting away from it. And in the meantime, you'll write to each other, you'll call each other. If love is real, distance does not matter. The next day, Sophia ran to see Boris off to the bus. She cried and waved. She waved to him for a long time. 
She gave him a fringe as a parting gift. She wove it herself, and a hand-embroidered handkerchief. How she missed him. How she longed for him. At night she sobbed into her pillow, and remembered how they had shared everything in the world, counted the clouds in the hut, and dreamed of grown-up. Beautiful love. It broke her heart to watch her granddaughter suffer. But she understood that there was nothing to be done about it. Time is the best healer. It heals all wounds. At first the lovers often called each other, talked for hours and hours about everything in the world, and, and there seemed to be no great distance between them. But fate was different. Every day Boris called, less and less frequently, citing business, and then he stopped calling altogether. The subscriber's phone is switched off or is out of range. A metallic voice said in response to Sofia's calls, so you've fallen out of love, found someone else. Our heroine said aloud, wiping tears from her cheeks. After high school, Sophia decided to go to the city to attend medical school. Now it was. It was grandma's turn to cry her eyes out and say, Sophia, my darling granddaughter, look there. Don't let yourself be hurt. Study hard. Don't skip classes. And don't you dare to do anything. You won't do any harm. Remember, if you love someone, don't let them do anything. Honor. You must keep your honor till the wedding. Here, take some raspberry cakes and some money to live on. I've been saving a penny from every pension. That's it, darling. Long farewells. Unnecessary tears. Run. Granddaughter hugged her grandmother tightly goodbye and burst into tears. Bay, I will miss you and come on vacation. Bye. Sophia was stunned by the crowds and bustle, the beauty, the power, and the intensity of the capital city. Growing up in a remote village, she felt like a savage, a Mowgli. The girl with, with great difficulty she barely made it to the medical school, got on the wrong bus three times, and endlessly, asking passersby for directions. There were crowds of people running around. Sophia felt so, alone and helpless among them. When she finally reached the college, she wandered through the corridors, looking for the admissions office. Everywhere, there were students in white coats and hats. Sophia leaned against a column, closed her eyes, and clutched her bag to herself. Her head was spinning. Her heart was popping. Her mouth was dry. Jesus, I'm not going to make it here. Maybe I should run away, before it's too late, and go back to grandma's. It's all plain and simple there, space and freedom, and here. Suddenly someone called out to the girl. Hey, what are you doing? Are you sick? Are you to go to school? You can tell at once, a new girl like me. Let's get acquainted. My name's Julia. I also go to the nursing department, and you. Sophia looked at the stranger with gratitude, and only nodded frightened. The perky Julia showed Sophia where the admissions office was. Sophia in gratitude let her copy the answers to the exam, and so they became friends. The girl got in from the first time, passed exams with honors. She was only happy with her studies. She also asked to stay in the same room with Yulia in the dormitory. Soon they became friends with their roommates, got along well, did everything together. They cleaned, studied, and had time to go for a walk. That's what youth is all about. Gradually, Sophia got used to the frantic rhythm of the big metropolis and already felt comfortably here. Studying was surprisingly easy for her, especially internships. Sophia was sent to a very prestigious but responsible place, the surgical department of a private hospital. At first, it was not easy. She had to put every case through her heart often crying, worrying. The head of the department, Genity immediately. The head of the department, Genity immediately noticed the new nurse and immediately fell in love with her. The man had already had two marriages, and both his spouses were considerably younger than himself. The surgeon had an unhealthy weakness for, he had an unhealthy weakness for young women. He was shaking with passion and lust for the sake of his desire to possess a young and unsophisticated body, he was willing to do anything, even marriage, 
especially since for him it was just a formality. At first, Genity tried to take the fortress on board with a swoop, but immediately got a sharp U-turn. Then he changed tactics, moved Sophia closer to him as a surgical nurse, teaching her, patronizing her, helping her with her work. And so they became very close and practically became friends, even though they were 15 years apart. And then it was just a matter of time to make a big deal out of it. The surgeon could do that like no one else. The bunches of roses, the declarations of love, trips to movies and celebrity concerts, gourmet restaurants and boat rides. That's it. That's it. Sophia fell in love with Genity, completely losing her head and not noticing the obvious things. Girls on a reception tried to talk sense into her. Sophia, come to your senses. Genity is an excellent. Sophia, come to your senses. Genity is a great specialist, no doubt about it. But he's a terrible womanizer. The previous spouse, they say, even beat up. He's a domestic tyrant. Why do you need all this? He doesn't miss a single new skirt. But the girl did not even want to listen to anything and only repeated that her Genity the best man on earth. Genity began to steer her away from her friends and acquaintances, filling her whole inner world. He constantly whispered to her, Well, why do you need to communicate with these fifties? What good can they do you? Because they're just a couple of short-tempered girls and you're a smart one. Let's be alone together candles, romance, wine. At first the girlfriends, although they were offended. Sophia was invited to the party, but then they gave up. If she didn't want to go, let her not go. After six months of passionate and sensual courtship, Genity and Sophia modestly married. Girls from the department were outraged. What a bastard. Even for the wedding money squeezed. Poor Sophia, she's in trouble. She doesn't know what's waiting for her. Tanya was so cheerful and confident before that ghoul. And when they got divorced, she was a scaredy goosey shadow. The newlyweds moved to live in the surgeon's country mansion. At first, Sophia couldn't get enough to be married at first. She was stunned by the luxury and splendor and was afraid to touch anything, lest she accidentally break it. Her husband was gentle and sensitive, called her affectionately a kitten, and gave her affection and passion at night. Sophia responded in kind, trying as best she could to please him in everything. To adjust herself to her husband, to conform to him, almost immediately after the wedding, Genity forbade her to work. Kizilia, why should you get up before dawn and go to surgery? You get tired. You don't get enough sleep. And this, by the way, affects everything on me. I'm gonna give you. I've got you covered. Don't worry about it. You better take care of the house. Be a real hostess. Sophia tried to resist. Gen 80, darling, but I love my... I love my job so much. Well, do you want me to take night shifts? I do not want to sit at home. Suddenly the spouse, a second change of tone, shouted. Don't have to tell you twice. Remember, I said, you will be home, period. Do not have a bad habit of arguing with me. It will end badly. Sophia couldn't believe her eyes. It was the first time she had seen him react like that. And she even became a little afraid. Dodgy Genity, noticing this, pressed his wife and kissed her passionately, thereby closing the subject. But as it turned out, that was only the first bell. Six months later, their once happy family life has turned for Sophia into a living hell. She felt like the events of the movie Slave Isora were unfolding right in her home. There was no longer tenderness and tenderness left no trace. Genity as if changed. He was like a gentleman, lived happily ever after, giving commands, and she, like a servant girl, they had to immediately execute. Not only that, Sophia had to beg for money for the bare necessities. Pantyhose, pantyhose, and pantyhose, and pantyhose products. The essentials, pantyhose, feminine hygiene products, perfume. And about the fact that to buy something, 
and to buy something for the soul or to visit a salon was out of the question. There was more. Genity forbade her alone anywhere. Or go out at all. Only go with the chauffeur Ivan. That man was not bad, but very loyal to the master, like a faithful dog. Sophia understood now what a mess, and why her two previous wives could not stand such a life. But what was the use? The trap has snapped, and now she cannot get out. There is a new janitor on the estate. Sophia had heard, of course, but in three weeks she had not yet met him. Ever met him in three weeks? The man tried to stay out of sight of the owners, and preferred to work. Early in the morning, when everyone was still asleep. But this Saturday was different. A huge alibi. Felix ran away from the enclosure, and the poor gardener fader together with the new janitor, tried to chase the dog back, but they didn't do a very good job. Felix, who had sensed his freedom, was jumping up and down, disobeyed, lashed out, and barked loudly. Woken up and angry, Jenity went out on the porch to see who hadn't let him sleep on his day off with the idea of giving those to the two knuckleheads. Sophia, frightened and sleepy, threw her cloak over her robe and ran out. The master shouted, Felix, get out of the way. Quickly, I said, or I'll take a whip. The dog, hearing Jenity's voice, shrugged his tail and whimpering quickly moved to the enclosure without anyone's help. Jenity irritably continued, What a circus! Two men couldn't quietly chase the dog away. Then he turned to his wife. By the way, this is our new janitor, Boris. Meet him. The guy muttered, Hello, and pulled his hat up over his eyes, and Sophia stood there with her mouth open, mouth like a statue. She could not believe her eyes. Boris, it was her Boris. The one, her friend from the village. It can't be. Her husband barked at her. Why are you frozen? Or do? You like this Lomax. You know him. The woman twisted her head and hastily replied. Sorry, I thought about it. It just looks like. I was mistaken. Sophia's mind was now occupied. How to find a moment to talk to Boris. Why did he look so bad? Dressed like a tramp. What had happened to him? I haven't seen him in so many years. Maybe he needed some help. Finally, after a week, Jenity left for a symposium in the next town for two days. Sophia couldn't. Sophia could not wait for that moment, steadfastly endured all pricks and antics of her husband just to hurry to say goodbye to him. That same evening Sophia, trembling with excitement, she knocked quietly at the gatehouse. The boy looked through the window, smiled, and happily went to open it. They literally jumped into each other's arms. Both of them were crying profusely. Sophia wailed. God, Borchka, I could not believe it when I saw you. How glad I am that we met. How I missed you, if you only knew. The man couldn't contain his emotions either. Sophia, sweetheart, believe me, not for one second did I forget about you. I never thought I'd see you again. I never thought I'd see you again. What a joy. When the first flurry of emotion wore off, Boris began to tell me about his miserable fate. When I went to town with my parents, things didn't work out. Things didn't work out the way they wanted them to, much less for me. Everything was fine at first, my father. My father worked as a bus driver. My mother worked in a sewing factory. We rented an apartment. Everything was like everyone else. I, however, was not liked by the city majors at school. They called me a redneck and were all trying to, and always tried to hurt me. I barely made it through school, and then everything went wrong. First, my mom died unexpectedly. And more importantly, it was so sudden. Can you imagine, it was just appendicitis, but she didn't come out of the anesthesia. I was so crying, grieving, my dad kind of did too. But when he brought home a couple of months after mom's death, that obnoxious Anton in a home, I understood everything. He had been going out with her for a long time, the scoundrel, cheating on mom. And she is not a poor lady, she has her own restaurant. That's why her father fell for her money. 
You ask her why. My father with that kind of money. I thought about it a lot too, and I realized that her unbearable character. No one could stand it. And my father put up with it for the money. She didn't give a damn about people at all. She dismissed me. She dismissed me as a piece of garbage. She said you're grown up, you can separate, go to work, do what you want, but you will not live in my mansion. I thought my father would stand up for me, but he didn't. He just mumbled. Well, don't be offended, son, you see how it is. My mom's gone, and I can't do it alone. And I was only 17. Where could I go to work? I enlisted in. I was a construction worker, carrying huge sacks of cement, carrying bricks, needing mortar. But they took away my passport and didn't pay me anything. They threw me out the door like a puppy. So, I wandered around, begged, worked as a loader at the market. They don't take me anywhere without papers. My phone was stolen a long time ago, back when I was sleeping on the heating pipe. And I didn't want to call you. I didn't want to bother you. To bother you. I thought you deserved better than the bum I'd become. And the other day, a nice man at the vegetable store, I unloaded a truckload of potatoes for almost nothing. So, he decided to thank me and restored my passport. That's how I came to work for you. So it's an unenviable fate for me, Sophia. You're doing very well for yourself, aren't you? Husband's rich. A mansion. But you don't look happy, do you? Your eyes look like they've gone blank. The woman sighed heavily and began to tell about herself. I, as I always dreamed, finished medical school for an internship got into a surgical. I had always dreamed about it. I finished medical school. I got an internship in a surgical department. I liked my job so much. And I was stupid enough to fall in love with that old man. I fell in love. Genity was the head of the department. He took care of so beautifully, bought me with his tenderness and affection. We got married, and my agony began. First he forbade me to work, then to talk to my girlfriends. And now he has me like a servant, and he's like a lord. Boris, he scares the hell out of me. He's frightening when he's mad. He'll throw a chair once and take a swing at me. Any wrong word can. I'm afraid to say anything at all. Damn this golden cage. I'll die in it. And Sophia cried, unable to hide her emotions. It was unbearable for Boris to see the tears of the woman he loved. He instinctively pressed her to him and began to kiss her fingers, then her hands, then her neck, and then everything happened by itself. A whirlpool of frenzied passion swirled them around and took them to the top of their pleasure. Sophia wailed frightened when she came to her senses. God, what have we done? What will happen now? And if Genity finds out, he'll kill me. And you too. Boris covered her mouth with a passionate kiss, and she collapsed in his tender and sensitive arms. Their secret romance had been going on for two months. Sophia was terribly afraid that her husband would suspect anything. In addition, now that Boris was in her life, she was disgusted by the embrace Genady, his rudeness, and their intimacy practically disappeared to nothing. Her husband was furious, and Sophia did not know what excuses to come up with, whether it was a headache or women's health, but her life finally made sense. Boris was the light in the window. She counted the minutes from date to date. She tried to come. Bora late at night, throwing on her hood and leaving early in the morning before dawn, and only when Genity was on duty at night in the clinic. But the surgeon has long noticed changes in the young. Spouse just long could not figure out what's what. She seems to be at home as before, but she looks gorgeous. Her cheeks are flushed, her eyes are burning, and she smiles all the time, and she doesn't even notice his banter. She listens to him half-heartedly and answers inappropriately. Yeah, sure, whatever you say. One day the chauffeur, Ivan, knocked on the door of the master's office. Genady asked in surprise. What do you want, Vanya? Have you come for the settlement? It's so early at the end of next, 
at the end of next week. Or what's wrong with the car? He coughed, lowered his head, and started. Genity, you know, I've been faithful to you all my life. What I wanted to say was, you should look at the cameras I installed near the gate not so long ago, because I don't like our new janitor. He's suspicious. He's all dressed up. He's changed. Unrecognizable. Maybe he's stealing something. The surgeon thought about it. All right. I'll look. Thanks for your vigilance. Ivan, go to the garage. Genity closed the door and turned on the tape. At first, nothing interesting. And then, appeared. Boris, even though it's dark, but you can see, and there's the wife. What were they talking about? The man switched over to the camera closer to the couple and turned on the sound. Sophia, my love, don't drive me away. I would die without you. You're the meaning of my life. I think about you day and night. I love you too, Borenka, but you know it's all wrong. I'm afraid for you and for me. I've got to run. Bye. The blood boiled in Genady's veins. He was just mad with jealousy. He was hurt. His sick self-love. And he literally bellowed. Ah, you love then. Ah, you cannot live. Are you afraid? And rightly so. I'll show you how to love. The man uncorked a bottle of alcohol and gulped down more than half. He ran madly into Sophia's room, grabbed her sleepy by the hair and dragged her into the study. She screamed wildly and balked. The man threw her on her stomach right on the leather couch and with his hands behind her back, turned on the video. What do you think of the movie, honey? You like it? Isn't it interesting? Sophia understood everything. There was no point in denying it. Sooner or later it. It all had to come out sooner or later. She only kept silent and cried, hoping that after that, Genity would, and she and Borea would be happy. But it was not like that. Enraged Genity took off the belt from pants and began to flog his wife, saying, and this is how you like it. And like this, bastard. I'll beat it out of you. I'll beat that love for a bum out of you. Apologize. Immediately. But the stubborn woman only cried softly, howling in pain and tears. Let us go, Genity. I want to be with him. Please. You don't love me, do you? But he wouldn't stop. Never. Remember, you're my thing. You're my toy. I want to spoil you. I want to break you. Understand. Now go to your room until I decide the punishment is over and I'll take care of your boyfriend. You, you'll never see him again, believe me. Sophia, weeping and exhausted, fell on her knees and begged, Genetti, you'd better kill me right now. Just don't hurt Borea, please. But her husband only pushed her into the room, locked the door from the outside and left laughing wildly in his drunken rage. Finishing the bottle, the jealous man began to think of an insidious plan of revenge against Boris. One could, of course, simply, to throw him out, but that's too easy. You don't want to get your own hands dirty either. A big man, not a fragile Sophia. That's when Genity remembered two old patients, bandits whom he had illegally stitched up in his department after bullet wounds. They owed, owed, so the surgeon boldly called and reminded himself, briefly outlined the situation, that the client, that the client had to be taught a lesson, but not to death, and thrown out. It was like snapping sunflower seeds for the thugs. Boris was beaten in a long and subtle way, purposely done under Sophia's bedroom window. She was crying, screaming and pounding on the glass. She couldn't bear to watch Boris being kicked. She cried for three nights. Her whole body ached and was covered with abrasions, but compared to the, to the wounds of her soul, it was nothing. She folded her hands in prayer and asked the Lord, Please, God, help Bora to live. I love him so much. I'd rather that beast, if only Boris would live. Genity kept Sophia locked up for a week. He took her out only in the morning and evening to shower and toilet. He slipped food under the door. Every day he told her, 
Say, you're sorry. Otherwise, you'll stay here forever. But stubborn Sophia kept quiet like a partisan. She hated Genity, looked at him and thought, how could I love that monster? And the girls warned me. That evening the key in the lock turned, and the quiet, inconspicuous housekeeper Luzia slipped a note into her, in her hand. Then she whispered, Summit, let him open for you. It will be easier, just as quietly. She buried the door and left. Surprised, Sophia with trembling hands opened the note and almost jumped for joy. It was from Boris. V. It said, My love, I'm alive. They couldn't break me. I won't give up on you. As soon as you can, let Lyusa know and run. I'll meet you. She won't give you away. Don't be afraid. I love you. Kisses. Borea. Sophia had the desire to live again. Now she began to hatch a plan. How to escape from this hateful house. When Genity opened the door in the morning, he was pleasantly surprised. Sophia was not lying like a log against the wall, but was awake, fresh, and even a little smiling. She said with a blunt look, forgive me, Genady, he really not worth it. Let's make up. The husband blossomed and at last released Sophia from her imprisonment. He added in a satisfied voice, that's better. Go make daddy's favorite omelet and pancakes, quick. Happy Sophia went into the kitchen to cook. The only thing on her mind was, how can I? And escape. So scary, if anything goes wrong, it won't be spared a second time for sure. After a hearty and delicious meal, Genity mellowed and looking at his wife, languidly said, I'm going on business. You Ivan will take you to the store, buy some lingerie interesting. Tonight you will work off the guilt until I decide that enough. Do you understand? Sophia only nodded her head obediently, but her own stomach shuddered at the prospect. She panicked. We must make up our minds. There won't be another chance like this, either today or, or never again. I won't survive if that bastard tortures me all night. It's beyond me. As she passed the kitchen, Sophia stealthily approached Lucia and slipped a note into her apron, giving her a meaningful Look, she only nodded her head in silence and continued, as if nothing had happened, to wash the dishes. In the note she wrote, Borisenko, wait for me at two o'clock at the back exit of the store, Adele. Next she waited until Genity was gone, threw all her documents into her purse. Then with trembling hands she took out some papers from her husband's desk. She had known about them for a long time. There. There were almost all of her husband's black payments and shady dealings. She thought to herself, God knows, Genity, I did not want war, but you left me no choice. Then she meticulously gathered herself, dressed up, and said to Ivan, as if nothing had happened, well, shall we go? Genity ordered the driver to keep an eye on his wife and threatened, if anything, not to tear his head off. So. The chauffeur followed the woman into the store without any hesitation. Sophia panicked terribly. What if? What if Lucy could not give Bora a note? Or something will go wrong. Also Ivan this, like a bloodhound, following her around, how frightening. She had packed a whole pile of sets of underwear and lace peignoirs and retired to the dressing room. But she was not at all concerned to try on. She looked at her watch. It was half past three, and Ivan was standing right next to the screen. At last the chauffeur got tired of waiting and strolled about the store, thinking to himself that as he was in such a place, he should also look for something nice for his woman. Sophia, seizing the moment, tiptoed out of the dressing room and to a surprised saleswoman. A surprised saleswoman to keep quiet rushed like the wind to the emergency exit. At the appointed place stopped, a frightened Boris. Seeing Sophia running, he instantly oriented himself and dragged her into a nearby cab, and they rushed away to their new and happy life. Another 20 minutes passed, and the owner's wife never came out of the fitting room. 
the chauffeur, suspected something was wrong, and asked, Sophia, are you, are you all right? Have you been here long? There was silence in reply. Then the man pulled back the curtain and was horrified. There was no one inside. The laundry was still hanging on the hook. He yelled at the salesman in a frenzy. Where is she? Where did she go? The girl answered indignantly. How should I know? She must have gone away. There are so many people today that I keep track of every customer, according to you. Ivan ran up to the cash register. Where is your other exit? Quickly. The girls frightenedly pointed in the direction. The man ran out, but it was too late. The fugitive was long gone. He clutched his head in horror. I'm finished. Genity will skin alive. How could did I miss her, you old fool? When the owner heard what had happened, there was a torrent of scolding on the phone. He threatened to blow everything to smithereens, and he told Ivan not to come back at all until he found Sophia. At this time, Boris was cradling and kissing Sophia, right in the cab. They just couldn't tear themselves away from each other. Finally, the woman asked, Boria, where are we going? And anyway, what do we do next? Genity will find us. And then, we'll be dead for sure. The man replied, We're going home. Sophia, to your home village. To your beloved grandmother. Do you mind? Aya. I thought, what are we going to do in the capital? We both have had enough of city life. Sophia was glad. What a good idea. It's been ages. I haven't seen my grandmother in ages. She will be glad, won't she? Yugosha was just baking her signature. Pies when someone knocked on the gate. The dog Umka didn't bark, but wagged her tail happily. As if smelling someone familiar. When the old woman saw Sophia and Boris on the threshold, she was very happy. She rushed to hug and kiss her granddaughter. Sophia gibbered, Babul, and we have come for good to live. Do you mind? She answered joyfully. No, dear, I'm only glad. I can't take the farm by myself for a long time. You see, children, I told you once that if love is real, then distance doesn't matter. And you didn't believe me. The old woman stoked the banya, made fresh, herbal tea, and began to feed the dear guests with treats. For the first time in a long time, Sophia slept. A sweet sleep. In the morning, she stretched herself with pleasure, as she had once done as a child, and at once she smelled her grandmother's pancakes. She tiptoed up, washed her face with spring water, and went out on the porch. The sun rose long ago. Chickens were pecking at millet while walking. Imposingly in the yard, Umma was peacefully sniffing near the kennel, and Tamashka the cat licked fresh milk from a bowl. The woman sniffed the fresh country air and whispered, My God, it's so nice to be home. To her surprise, Boris had not slept for a long time, but rolled up his sleeves and chopped wood and stacked it neatly under the lean-to. Then the three of them went for herbs into the woods, as they had done before, taking long walks, ate fragrant strawberries, and talked. The next day, Sophia went to the village council, and she was easily employed as a nurse in a medical clinic. Morris also found a job. Tractor drivers were always in high demand in the village. Life went on. The wounds of the soul slowly healed. But still, Sophia flinched every now and then when a stranger passed by their house. She secretly very much feared that Genity would take revenge on her and even worse would come to make a scandal. And for good reason. After her escape, Genity was furious. He swore that he would take revenge on his wife. How so? He lost his favorite toy. What should I tell people? Where did his wife go? When the man called all Sophia's friends and acquaintances and realized that she was definitely not in town. He immediately guessed that she had nowhere else to go but to the country. Then he hired the same thugs who had attacked Boris and told them to bring his wife home by any means necessary. On that ill-fated day, Sophia had felt some uneasiness in the morning. She returned from work and decided to help her grandmother weed the beds. Boris, 
was still in the field. Suddenly, an expensive car rushed to the yard at full throttle and brazenly kicked open the gate, walked unceremoniously into the yard, and started shouting, Hey, is anyone alive? The frightened Evdokia threw down the bucket and asked threateningly, Who are you? And what do you want here? By what right did you come in here? One of the young men, ignoring the old woman, shouted, Sophia, come out, we're right behind you. Let's go nicely. Your husband's waiting for you at home. The woman on her bending legs came out of the garden into the yard. Tell Jenity I'm not going anywhere. And filed for divorce. Do not look for me. I will not go back to him. But she was not allowed to speak. The second young man dashingly grabbed the woman before she could even think about it and dragged her to her car. Sophia screamed wildly and tried to fight back, but the force was clearly not equal. Then a shot rang out from behind her. Everyone jerked. The bullies turned around. In the middle of the road stood Boris, holding his father's hunting rifle. He commanded, Get away from the woman. Otherwise I'll shoot. I have nothing to lose. I will not give Sophia to this. To this villain. Granny, go get the police officer. Yevdokia didn't have to. And she ran like a fly through the gardens to Vasilevich, who lived three houses away. And where did she get her impetuosity at such an age? The scoundrels were handed over to the police, Sophia called by the policeman. To the policeman called by the policeman. The same papers. Here is the proof of my ex-husband, Jenidi's shady dealings. He illegally operated the bandits and hid everything. And there are many interesting things. Jenity was scandalously expelled from the prestigious clinic. He was angry at the world. But, but of course, he blamed Sophia for all his troubles. He began to drink heavily. His hand stopped listening. And he was definitely no longer able to operate. Sophia and Boris lived happily ever after and were anxiously waiting for a new addition to the family. Granny, as an experienced healer, said there would be twins. The old woman rejoiced. Now I have lived long enough to have great-grandchildren. Thank you, God. Boris turned out to be an excellent family man and a diligent host. The house came to life and was transformed. He was fond of the lovely village from which he did not want to leave once. He could not get accustomed to the capital. Every day he rejoiced in his heart that the house was full, adored to the madness of his rounded, rosy-cheeked Sophia whom he had loved for as long as he could remember. To him, she was still the snub-nosed girl with, and that little girl with pigtails that he used to look at. And Sophia often remembered now of saying, first love never rusts. She always remembered Jenity with a shudder. And this plain, simple-looking and kind Borenka turned out to be the best husband in the world.